You know what time it is Time to hang hey, out with Mr. Cool We're Mr. Kuba We're Mr. Kuba We're Mr. Kuba Get the latest school From Mr. Kuba From Mr. Kuba From Mr. Kuba Hey, we're Mr. Cool We're Mr. Kuba We're Mr. Kuba We're Mr. Kuba We're Mr. Kuba Get the latest school From Mr. Kuba From Mr. Kuba Welcome to the Bit Scoop with Coop. I'm your host, Coop. Big shout outs to everybody that's listening right now on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening to. Also, don't forget, if you want to see the video recording of this show, make sure you go to thebitscoopwithcoop.com where you can catch episodes from season one all the way now. Also, you can catch me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash thebitscoopwithcoop. Also on Instagram, catch me there at Big Scoop with Coop and on YouTube at The Big Scoop with Coop. All right, people, enough about me. Today's guest, you have seen him on Def Comedy Jam. You've seen him on BET Comet View. You have seen him on Assisted Living. You have heard him on the Steve Harvey Morning Show. If I keep naming everything this guy's done, the show will be over. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. J. Anthony Brown. Now, Mr. Brown has been very successful in his career. He is a Peabody Award winner. He is a two-time NAACP Image Award winner. And we will talk to him about the Steve Harvey Morning Show. We will talk to him about when he became a comedian and still is a comedian. But we'll talk about his beginning roots of uh, being a comedian. We're going to actually talk about the show Assisted Living that you can watch on BET Live. All right, people. Let's kick back and relax. And I hope you enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen. Mr. J. Anthony Brown. Mr. J. Anthony Brown, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Can you see uh, What's me? going on, man? Glad, uh, thank you for having me on your show, first and foremost. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How's your day going so far? Everything's going good so far. Everything's going good. Can't complain. That's what I'm talking about. I'm in North Carolina, so... Um, what part? Uh, Rocky Mountain. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So, you know, the weather right now, it's got a little chilly. It's going off yeah. and on. Um, so, you know, fall is officially here. So yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Brown, I'm gonna let you know. Um, you've done like I told the world, how I told the whole world, you've done so much in your career already. <laughs> your career is nowhere close to being over. Um, but for the people that's been living under a rock, let's talk about that comedy career, how you actually started. When did you first realize that you want to become a comedian? Well, probably around 17 or 18 years old, you know, at that age. Uh, but prior to that, I was just, I was just gravitated toward anybody that made people laugh or anything that was funny, you know, funny relatives. I wanted to be in the room at that particular time. The Johnny Carson show was very funny, but unlike today, you didn't know who was going to be on the show until that time of night when he would announce who was on the show because TV guide hadn't been out yet. And there was nothing you could look at to see who was on the show. There were no previews as to who was coming on. So whenever there was a comedian on, it was something I wanted to watch. And we had this thing on the radio called the Comedy Hour. It was actually a 15-minute show when they would play clips from Moms Mabley, Pygmy, Markham, Wildman, Steve, uh, Blowfire, Red Fox, Bill Cosby. And I uh, it, sometimes they'd stick in some George Carlin and some uh, Jonathan Winters. And I just... Anybody that can make people laugh, I wanted to be around that person or I wanted to be an eye uh, shot of what they were doing. Uh, funny was just something I was gravitated toward. Well, you know what? Gravity must have hit you in the head real hard. Yeah. You're making people <laughs> laugh every day. So I got to give you your props on that. Um, now, Mr. Brown, what type of hurdles did you go through in the beginning of oh. your comedy career all the way up to now? Uh, at the particular at the particular time I started, um, you know, and it's hard to fathom when you talk to young and up and coming comics, which I, I applaud them of what they're doing, especially on the internet. You know, you hear a lot of people go, "Well, they haven't paid their dues, and they're just an internet comic." And you know, the dues that we pay now are not like the dues we paid back in the day. You can go on the internet internet and reach ten thousand people, and you can have a career and never reach 10,000 people. I'm talking about in a day. In a day, you can reach that many people. So when I started out, 
there were no quote unquote black comedy clubs. They didn't exist. There were no clubs that catered directly to black, uh, our black audience for comedy. There were clubs that had music and entertainment and a comedian could be connected to that. So um, when I first started, there were only quote unquote white comedy clubs. And, you know, and as time has progressed, it's because of the black comics that are out there now single-handedly saving the yuck yucks, the ha ha's, the improv, the chuckles, all of them. They're all being saved by black comedy. Had not it been for black comedy, these clubs would be closed because the tables has turned. So, I mean, uh, the other thing about it, it, it made me a better comic because I played white audiences in the beginning and then later shifted to the black audiences and was a, a learning experience for me, you know, but I'm so glad for it. I remember Mr. Brown, when I first got introduced to you, when I saw you um, <laughs> and kid, if, if there's anybody you watching that's young right now, that's watching worldwide, you probably ain't gonna remember this show that I'm about to say, but I know J. Anthony Brown remembers this, BT Comment View. That's what oh, you saw me on Comic View. Okay, but yes. uh, Comic View was 10 years, 10 to 15 years after um, mm -hmm. I did the uh, uh, Def Jam. So, right, so with yeah. me, I, I grew up, I didn't get to have the HBOs and stuff when I was young. <laughs> so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had to go with the second best thing, you know, BT. Yeah, yeah, you had to go <laughs> with the first thing, it was free and it was always prescribed. Well, one of the things I liked about when they allowed me to do Comic View and host Comic View, is that I came out, I don't know if you watched the show, but I wasn't set on just coming out each week and doing a stand-up. You know, I, I I mean, I could do it, but I like the fact when I hosted Comic View, I did skits, I came out, some one, one time I came out dressed like the dancers, one time I came out with the half suit on, and I just thought that I made, for me, I made the, the show a much more variety, and it made me, like I said, it made me, uh, a better comedian and a better host. And that came from the fact that I'd already worked in television for Arsenio. So yep. it was great for me. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I still remember coming to you like it was nothing. 10 o'clock PM. Eastern yes, Standard Time. Right, BET. I told you, man, I, I was there watching this when it was first coming out all the way and up. And I yeah. introduced a lot of good, you know, from the same thing with Def Jam. You know, it introduced a lot of black comics that are mainstream now. You know, Ernest J, um, um, Ashy Larry, um, Bruce Bruce, Bruce Bruce. All of these people were on that show. Uh, Jamie Fox, uh, Steve Harvey was was a big time comic at that particular time, and he came on the show and you know and hung out with me. And that was that's that's what Comic View did. The same as what Def Jam did. It was just another generation, and I was glad to be a part of it. Um, but like I said. Um, for me, it was the fact that Black comics were on the rise up, and we're, we're mainstream now. We are. We, you know, for lack of a better word, we are the shit. Exactly. We have saved these comedy clubs that 20 to 25 years ago, Negroes were not booked in these clubs. They weren't. They just didn't book them. You couldn't get any improv unless you had a television show like the George Wallace, Shirley Hemphill, Jimmy J.J. Walker, Sinbad, that type of thing. But now it has changed. And I'm glad to see that they're, they're, that they're doing it. But by the main token, Black comedy clubs, quote unquote, Black-owned comedy clubs are suffering because big name comics don't go to those clubs because they're so locked into the improvs and all these other places. But, you know, work is work. That, that's true. That's very true. So, ladies and gentlemen, is watching worldwide right now. I'm letting you know, it, J. Anthony Brown is one of the guys that started from the bottom, that worked his way <laughs> up to where he's at. Um, and when I say bottom, I'm not trying to say he was the bottom of the list. It wasn't his pre-internet days. Yeah, <laughs> what internet, I'm saying the, like that. The internet didn't exist. I was telling a friend right. of mine the other day when we would travel on the road. Uh, I would say I work with Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey and I became good friends on the road. Mm -hmm. You work on the road and you you play in these. I don't know if you ever seen these hotels in these movies where you open a door and you can see your car, and then beyond your car is a swimming pool. You've yep. seen those yep. type of hotels. Mm -hmm. Well, not only did we stay in those, but a lot of those things 
uh, the switchboard would go off at 10 o'clock. So we didn't have cell phones. So in order to call somebody, you know, to let them know you were okay, you had to make that call like before you left to go do the show because by the time you came back, the lady who ran the switchboard and the phone service was off. There was no room service. There was no Google Maps. You read your map. And you, you know, so it was, you know, but like I said, it made me a better comedian because I did, I did all that. As much as these comics today have a struggle, it's just a different type of a struggle. That's so true. That is so true. Now, Mr. Brown, did you have any um, mentors to help you out, you know, in the beginning of your career all the way up? Not, not so much as mentors, but I had a lot of people that I looked up to. I mean, it, it, for all of his troubles and all of his um, shenanigans, I, I, I was a big Bill Cosby fan. Ooh. I really would listen to Bill Cosby. Uh, uh, Richard Pryor came along later, uh, but Bill Cosby, Pig Meat Mark and Moms Mabley, those people were my idols. But one of my, a couple of my favorites was Jonathan Winters and definitely George Carlin. And, you know, when I went to see Richard Pryor live in uh, Atlanta, it just, I was amazed. I was amazed to see somebody make people laugh that hard. And I was just like, Lord, if I could just get an <laughs> inkling of that. And I think I've achieved it. I think I've achieved it. Maybe not his fame and notoriety, but to make people laugh as hard as I know, I've made people laugh in the audience. It's a testimonial to the work that I put into it and that when you got them, you got them. But true. before I go on stage, I'm I'm a nervous wreck. A nervous wreck. What? Oh my God. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Brown. You you've done so much. How oh my God. Oh, and could you with, still have a nervous every, moment? <laughs> with everything I've done, I've done, I'm nervous every show. Wow. I mean, unbelievably nervous. The pacing, the sweating, the, the I don't think they're gonna like me. It's just so much doubt <laughs> that they go so no, you caught me off guard with that one. Oh uh, you know, I went to see a movie, the Julie Garland story. And uh, and I've I've seen the the play Beautiful, which was a story about Carol King, who wrote was a great songwriter. But they talk about stage fright, and my and I could relate to it. And to this day, I mean, it's it's, it's crazy. I owned a club for twelve years, and I would be a, I would be nervous every time I went up in my own club. That's crazy. That is yeah. crazy. L ladies and gentlemen, once again, I got to speak to you real quick. If J. Anthony Brown still gets nervous and got nervous through his career, don't feel bad if you get nervous. If no, no, no I don't, I don't, I don't no, take that away from anybody who goes on stage and, and is nervous. And it's beyond nervous. It's, it's a fear that you don't know what the hell is going to happen because at that particular point, it takes one person one person or a group of people to destroy your show so you don't know what's going to happen you have no idea when you go out you don't know what's going to happen i believe you know it. you're prepared but you don't know you have no idea i believe it now let j anthony brown let's talk about this real quick man you not only you're a comedian man you're an award winner also <laughs> let's talk about this peabody award and also the NAACP Image Award. How excited are you? Two NAACP That's Image. true. Thanks for correcting me. Two of them. You are two-time. So how excited were you when you won both of these awards? And did you see it coming? No. Uh, one, uh, I was in L.A. at the time of the L.A. riots, the, the last L.A. riots, uh, which was connected to the Rodney King um, verdict. Mm -hmm. uh, I had I had a free radio job that I was working on Stevie Wonder station KJLH yeah. and I would go there in the morning to be on the show with a young man by the name of Rico Reed and around 9 30 I would leave there and go do the Arsenio Hall show so when the riot broke out I was still we were working and I think Arsenio did the last show you could see the riot on television the riots the burning of the city and so I went to the station you know, I thought it would be a good place to be at the station. And that, at that particular time, Stephen Wonder's station 
was in, uh, when I say in the neighborhood, I hate to say the term in the hood, but it was on <laughs> Crenshaw and they had this big window that you could see the street, you could see the jobs. I mean, if you ever saw the movie, um, was it, uh, what was the movie um, with Samuel Jackson where he played the DJ? Was it School Days? School Days, I think. That's yeah, what School Days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that, that radio station was set up like that. And there's stories of people who, when you play their record and if they were in LA, they would come by the station and tap on the window. I, I've heard stories of Marvin Gaye doing that. But anyway, I, I went to the station and we stayed on the air for like 24 hours. We actually saw the riot and then we actually saw the people after the riot to try to clean up the city. So it was a total dynamics of watching people tear up and then watching people try to build the community back up. And for that, we got a Peabody Award. I mean, uh, a Peabody Award and an NAACP Award. And then my second one was for my participation with the Tom Joyner Show. Mm-hmm. Now, you know what? You, like I said, it, it shows your talent already, Mr. Brown for the things that you have done in the past all the way up to the current. Um, And it's amazing. And this should be a true testament to anybody. It doesn't matter your age, your gender, your race, your religion, whatever. If you put your mind to it and you actually do what you're going to do, you will get rewarded at the end of the day for your work. Well, I definitely believe that. You're absolutely right. You know, because in the beginning, man, like I said, there were no, there, there were the black, the black um, quote unquote black comedy audience did not exist. I remember in a a place in uh, Mobile, Alabama, uh, a radio jock started this thing where he had a, he had a radio station and he started a quote unquote black night of comedy. And and then when I did Def Jam, I saw an all black audience. And from that, you know, it just kind of blew up and ballooned. But in the beginning, it, it just didn't exist. It, you know, there were white comedy clubs and you played those clubs. But I think one of the things that helped us out, uh, the Steve Harveys, the Bernie Max, the Cedric the Entertainers, that they would put us on these shows with these white comics, we would blow their ass off the stage. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a testimonial to how good we were because we were hungry. You know, you had somebody who was coming in I could name names, somebody like Rich Hall, who was from Saturday Night Live, or some of these comics that would come in from New York who thought they were the shit. And these local comics that were from New York and Texas and Alabama and Chicago, we would wear their ass out. And, you know, to the (laughs) point where they would go, well, could you switch? I'm like, hell no, I ain't switching. (laughs) No, you don't want making all the money. I'm doing 30 minutes. You're supposed to do an hour. You know, and the stuff they would say to you, you know, Harry Anderson was another one, you know, the guy who did Court yeah. Night. Yeah. Uh, I, I, when they put me on the stage with him, it wasn't even, it wasn't even close what we would do to him. It wasn't close. We, we, and we were determined to go out there and be good at what we did. That's how we moved up to headliner. Because if you, if you pull your act back because somebody who comes behind you is weak, they're not going to notice you. You're not going to shine. So I always tell people, I mean, and Patti LaBelle will tell you, you know, if you come and sing with Patti LaBelle and you're not on the level that she sings, you're going to get blown off the stage. Yes, you will. And, I, and now, don't get me wrong. Now, I've been blown off the stage by some of these comedians who, you know, I wasn't seasoned and I wasn't ready. And they just blew my ass off the stage and made me a better comedian. It That's what I'm about to say. Better. And that's all I'm about to say, Mr. Brown. But you know what? You ate your fair share of comedians also for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have. So yeah, I, I, was, I was eating and I ate. So you're right. <laughs> you did. You did. Now, now Mr. Brown, let, let's talk about this. You brought him up a while ago. That's Steve Harvey. Now, um, how excited were you when you actually knew that you was coming on to the Steve Harvey Morning Show? Well, that was a that was a that was a career move for me because I left the Tom Jordan show mm-hmm. not knowing what I was going to do. And the thing that um, that I uh, I thank Steve for Steve is always, you know, I mean, it's like any friendship, any friendship that you have over the years. It, there can be ups and downs, but in the end, and uh, for most cases, he has spoken up for me. I mean, he had a television show called Me and the Boys. Uh, myself, Rashawn McDonald, and myself, 
were in his quote unquote camp. And he went to bat for us and neither one of us had written on a television show. And Steve made it clear that I wasn't gonna do this show unless you hire these two guys. Now their attitude was, we don't know what they can do. They never written on a television show. And he was adamant and very clear about that. And that's how we got on the show. And that's how we got into the Writers Guild. The same thing with this show. He had been asking me years to, while I was over with Tom, to come over and switch over to his side. So when I left Tom, he offered me a job. And, you know, I'm, I'm ever more thankful for that. I was able to stay there, you know, four or five years or three to four years until I retired and started to do something else. So it was great for me, you know, and that's because of the friendship we had. Okay. Now to, to clear all the different, I don't want to say internet rumors or whatever, but I want to hear it straight from your mouth. Are you officially gone from the Steve Harvey morning show? I mean, Oh yeah, I'm officially gone from the Steve Harvey, but what happened, what happened was this, uh, in the contract that I had, uh, anything. And it's kind of like any job. If you work on a job and you come up with a, a concept or something like that, if it is created on that job, the job owns it. So for me, a lot of the song parodies and a lot of the skits that I put together while I was working for the Steve Harvey show, they own them and they still have the right to play them. But it does make me sound like I'm still on the radio. So it's cool. I have no problem. No problem. No problem. Now, I want you to finish this line off for me because, Mr. Brown, I listen to uh, to the Steve Harvey Morning Show a lot, and you always tell people, don't forget to get or try your, try these. No. You're telling them. <laughs> <that. laughs> don't forget to try. <laughs> don't forget to try my nuts. I have a... <laughs> I have peanuts that I sell along with my hot sauce and I'm about to introduce a wine. The peanuts are hotter than the mofo nuts and the hot sauce is hotter than the mofo along with the other flavors, peach and pepper, cayenne, habanero and garlic. But it's so funny that at a particular point when I go to a new place, I'll give you know several cans of the nuts away. And then, you know, when you go back, it's so cool to go back and then have some dude, it's usually a dude, hey man, uh, I don't know how to say this, but I really like your nuts, man. You know, so. <laughs> how, you know what? You, see, we, we're, I'm, I'm improv right now. Ladies and gentlemen, J. Anthony Brown, the first one in 10 seasons, got me to say this to another dude. Somebody <laughs> say it. Mr. Brown, how can everybody get your nuts? How can everybody get my nuts? How everybody can get your nuts? Tell everybody how to get your nuts, man. You can go to how to, you can go to jandybrown.com or hottertinamofo.com and you can order my nuts. But for you, I think I'd like to send you a can of my nuts and then you can try my nuts. And then the next time we talk, you can tell me how you enjoyed my nuts because you sound like you would like to try my nuts. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. They're good nuts. They are. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go try Mr. J. Anthony Brown's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, this is the time of the order. year when it's when it's cold outside that you would enjoy a hot nut in your mouth. And so that's great. You, what? <laughs> you heard it. You you didn't hear it here first, but you heard it on this show first. <laughs> go order his nuts. Look out for his wine that's coming out. Make sure you get all his products because. Trust me, I, never mind. I'm not going to say that part. Yes. People are saying his nuts are good. So go get his nuts. <laughs> go get <laughs> no, those, the, those, the people who have had them, Yeah. they will testify that my nuts are good, you know, really. And my nuts are made right here in the United States. So they're not foreign nuts, which is great. You know, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody <laughs> worldwide, J. Anthony Brown, give them that website one more time how to get those nuts. Yeah, you go to janthonybrown.com and you can follow me on janthonybrown.com. Uh, once a week or uh, sometimes every two weeks, George Wallace, Myra J. and myself, we go to breakfast and we post that. I'm also on the Civil Wilk show. We do a podcast and I'm on her show, uh, What You Need to Know. Uh, I also do assistant living with Mr. Tyler Perry. 
So. Yeah, that's what we're about to get into right now. So what is it like or how, actually, it's a two-part question. The first question is, how excited were you for this? To get on to this? This, this, this was, I was supposed to get this job. I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, and I thought, uh, I thought getting it, meaning I had reached a point where I had been on so many auditions and anybody black in this business will tell you the the terms of auditioning is, is, is grueling. You audition, you get a call back, and then you don't get the part. And it's because there's so many blacks who are going out for the same one or two roles Mm-hmm. Not like, you know, today you see a large Black production with an all-Black cast. Or, uh, I mean, but back in the day, you could see an all-Black cast, and they would have all-White writers. So with that being said, the audition process was set up different back in the day. You could no longer, you know, have the, sa- the sides. This is like the sides are the portion that you're going to audition. They call it the sides. Meaning... Say they take a piece out of uh, the color purple. They send that to you, and then you go in and audition for that thing. So so I reached the point where I'm like, if they want me, they want me. I'm not auditioning anymore. I- I'm done. I've gone on these auditions. I don't get the part. It becomes, it becomes frustrating. And it doesn't, and not only that, I was never really good at auditions. I never, like, knocked it out of the part I, because... I would be so nervous that I would lose, I would lose it, you know, and then it, like for them, for instance, the Martin show, it was between me and Garrett Morris. They go in the room, they pick Garrett Morris. Uh, the barbershop show, um, mm-hmm. uh, barbershop, it was between me and another actor. They picked the other actor. Um, the wash was between me and George Wallace. They picked George Wallace. So the frustration was mounting. And then for me, I'm doing the radio, so I'm working, and I'm doing stand-up. So, I mean, I was saying to myself, you know, I'm not going to audition no more. So my manager calls me up, and she says, "Uh, um, Mr. Perry, you have to call him Mr. Perry when you work for him. Mr. Perry has a new show, and I think you'd be great as Benny. I said, I'm not auditioning anymore. I'm not going. I'm not going to go. She said, please go. If you go to this audition, I want to, I mean, and some things are just divine. It's just going to happen that way. I said, I'm not going. I'm just not going to go. She was, um, she begged me, just go to this audition. You're Vinny, yada, yada, yada. You're going to get it. All right. So I go, I get the sides from Vinny. I call my buddy who's a director. His name is James House. He's going to direct a pilot that we're doing. It's called the J-Spot. Anyway, that's the whole, I'm sidetracking. But I call him and we work on the thing on the phone. He lives in North Carolina. I live in LA. So, you know, you can see each other and we work on a part. I go to the audition. When I get to the audition, I can hear a white guy in the room auditioning for Vinny. And I'm going, he ain't Vinny. (laughs) I don't know if I'm going to get it, but I can tell you, this mofo is not going to be Vinny. There's no way they're going to pick him. The next guy is a comedian that I know, uh-huh. and I hear him, and I'm going, he ain't Vinny. I'm <laughs> Vinny. I was nervous, but I go in, and I nail it. I mean, I'm, I'm just having fun. I got the producer laughing. I got the camera person laughing, and she's like, you're great. Just slow down, yada, yada, yada. And I leave the audition. Now, I leave the audition with the attitude that I may not get it. They might not hire me, but I had a damn good audition. Okay, now we fast forward. I have already left the Tom Joyner show. So they asked me to come back for a reunion show where me, Sybil, and Tom Joyner will do the last show, you know. And we kind of didn't leave on great terms, but, you know, that's here, there. Sybil, who's playing the go-between, says, would you come back and do the last show? You know, I'm like, yeah, you know, I ain't mad no more. I'm working for Steve. You know, I'll come back and do it. I go back. We had a great time. That We just had fun. We just fell back into the rhythm that we had when I left. The last guest on the show... Mm-hmm 
is Tyler Perry. Now check this out. So I'd already had the audition. So in my mind, I said, do I confront him while we're live on the air or do I wait till the interview is over? Oh boy. So what would you do? If I was Jay, are you talking about as me as Coop or if I'm Jay? Yeah, just, Brown? yeah what would you do? I would have waited to after the show. That's what I did. Yeah. Really? Because I didn't want to put him on front. I didn't want to put him on, on blast, you know? Okay. You know, this, do they still say that, the young people? Yeah, but, hey, I'm 42, so I still say it. So it don't <laughs> matter. We're going to say it. I didn't, I didn't want to put him on blast. So I waited until the interview was over, and I said, hey, Mr. T at that particular time, you call him Tyler. And then I knew him because the way we did the show was I would be in LA or I would be in Atlanta and Tom and Sybil were always in Dallas. So mm -hmm. when Mr. Perry had a new movie, he'd come in the studio and stay two or three hours. You know, so we, I'm talking, I know the guy, you know, I know him. We could, we're shooting junk and, you know, I'm going to get Cokes and that, we, I mean, because he's promoting his movies. So mm -hmm. when the interview is over for the last show, I said, hey, uh, Tyler, I hear you have a new show. Could you put in a word for me? I'd like to be on it. He said, you need to audition. I said, I already auditioned. He said, no, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. He said, who are you audition with? And I told him. Two days after that, I got the part. Wow. Wow. Big shout out to Tyler Perry. Oh Big my God. Shout out to Assisted Living. Big oh my shout God. Out to yeah. Everyone. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. Now tell everybody, yeah. I've seen the show, of course, but it's been out for a minute. I love the show. Tell everybody worldwide that have not seen the show. How can they see this show, Assisted Living? What channel? What time? It's on BET Live. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it on BET Live. We're in our, we're, next time we go back up, we'll be in our fifth season. Uh, um, it's amazing the way we shoot. I've worked on different productions. I've worked on productions that were for ABC, CBS, NBC, and it would take a week to shoot a particular show. Mm -hmm. okay. We will shoot a show, two to three shows a day. The Ooh. complete show. Good. And it was weird because I thought when they hired me, I'm going to only be in eight shows. So my mindset is set. Okay, I'll do eight. I'll go home, yada, yada, yada. And they're like, no, you're doing 25 shows. I'm like, what? God is good. They get God all the time. And they give you a stack, a whole script, of uh, all the scripts. That's and, what I'm talking about. And you come in, you need to come in six ready. Meaning you should know six. If you know six, you're ahead of the game. That means you know the first three and you got the next three. So while you're working on the next three, you started working on the next, the other three. I see so. what you're doing. I see what you're doing. Yeah. Ladies and when and you're up in age, man, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> hey. But it's a lot of fun. Because, you know, once you learn, once you do it, um, uh, the seasoned actors, uh, Mr. Brown is amazing. Yeah. He can remember everybody's line. He knows everybody. He he knows everything. He has the most to say um, on, on the show. But, you know, you put the work in. And I was determined to put the work in and not be the old guy who holds up the show. I feel you. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> now, I got to say big shout outs to David and Tam Mr. David and Miss Tamela Mann for being on the show. Big shout out to Jeffrey Brown making that show going on his wheels also. Tyler Perry or Mr. Perry, big shout out to you for having this show out and everything that you've done. Now, Jeffrey Brown, is there any other projects that you're working on that you want the world to know about? Yes. Uh, um, um, Fox, I think it's called Fox Live. And it has a network. And it's it's a, an incendiary of the Fox network. Mm -hmm. Um um uh and they're they're interested in doing a comedy show so for 12 years in la i had a um i had a, a comedy club called the j spot mm -hmm. and the lady who's the young lady who used to work for me was my manager she's over at that network so she pitched that i would do a half hour comedy special a half hour comedy show called the j spot 
it's more like a variety show where we'll show different comedians, skits, song parodies, uh, and that's what I'm working on. So that's the next big. Nice. Everybody be on the lookout for it. It's coming soon. Make sure you follow J. Anthony Brown on Instagram. Well, if it is, yeah, it is Instagram. Um, all social media platforms because you never know what this man is going to do next. Now, <laughs> Mr. Brown, it's the last segment of the show right here. It's called Take the Floor. Now, you have up to two minutes. Say whatever uh, you want. No questions asked. J. Anthony Brown, take the floor. All right. Well, one of the things that's very near and dear to me is to, to emphasize how important it is. You know, I know we can get complacent sometimes, but how important it is for us to get out and vote. It is very important, especially at this election. And don't get tripped, don't get tripped up by the high prices of gas, because believe me, there ain't a damn thing the Republicans can do to bring this gas down. I think the Democrats have a, a caring attitude toward people uh, in terms of student loans, they've done that. Um, hearing aid, they've done that. Uh, and some of the other things that they're working on. And, and as much as the Republicans talk about what they don't like, you don't hear what they're going to do. And people are in, in dire straits right now. They need help, uh, especially, you know, with the Re Republicans taking away a woman's right to have an abortion. This election, the midterms is very important, you know, especially in Georgia. I just don't think people are that stupid. You know, and that's just my opinion, that they would elect Herschel Walker. I just don't, I, I mean, with everything in me. And that's why this election is very, very important, as much as all elections are. And when you think about what we had to go through, when I say we, we as a people, just to get the right to vote and then to be complacent about it, to me, it's almost laziness. So please register to vote. If you know somebody who hasn't registered, see if you can take them to the polls to register. And that's across the board. That's it. That's what's up. That's what's up. Mr. J. Anthony Brown, I want to say thank you for coming. Man, on thank show. you, man. Thank and you. I would, I would love to have you back on in the future. I'd love to come back. I'd love to come back. I'd like that's to talk up. about my art the next time I come back on. And we will definitely set that up. Ladies All and right. gentlemen. Make sure you stick around because my next guest on the Bit Scoop with Coop is. You know, I don't never announce my next guest. You better watch and find out on social media <laughs> and follow me. You better keep up to see who's coming up next. All right, people, until next time on the Bit Scoop with Coop. Peace. Thank you, man.